Oh my goodness, guys, we're we're here. Today is all about the Enneagram Type 9 and, and the song I wrote for it. And honestly, I can hardly believe it because not only does this brand new song bring closure to my Enneagram song project, which is nine songs from the perspective of the nine uniquely beautiful Enneagram types, but it's also the 25th and final song in my entire Atlas 2 series. Plus, I myself happen to identify as a type nine, so writing the song was a a really challenging and and personal mountain to climb. Uh, Honestly, I've been really looking forward to recording this episode and having the the privilege of getting to share the, the story about how this song came together and everything that I have been learning about myself in the process, as well as the the Enneagram type nines. Uh, Selfishly, I actually think it will be a really good thing, uh, probably a healthy thing for me to be able to process all of this out loud. Uh, So thank you for, for listening and for giving me that opportunity. My name is Ryan O'Neill, and I make music under the name Sleeping At Last. And in this podcast, I have the absolute privilege of getting to tell you the birth stories of my music. And super quickly, before we dive in and talk about all things Enneagram Type 9, I wanted to share that I released uh, two brand new songs into the WoW recently. The first of which belongs to my astronomy series, which are pieces of music inspired by astronomical events and discoveries, which is a passion of mine. Uh, I kind of like these little soundtracks for these observable events in space. So a little while ago, you may have seen the first ever image of a black hole. It was all over the news, really, really exciting. And I just think it's so cool that in our lifetime, we get to see what was believed to be unseeable. And the team of scientists and astronomers who discovered it called it Poehi. uh, And using eight telescopes from all around the world, they combined forces to create a Earth-sized telescope that was able to take this, this really beautiful image of a black hole. Uh, And because of those eight telescopes in this song, I limited myself to only eight instruments and wrote a piece of music inspired by this image. Uh, Also, I ran the image through this uh, this system that can convert images to sounds. And so I was able to use that washy kind of distorted sound you hear through the song. That's the actual image of of the black hole uh, converted to sound. It is out everywhere music is. It is called April 10, 2019, Poehi image of a black hole. Uh, And the link to that song is, of course, in the show notes. And then a few weeks back, I had the absolute honor of being invited to cover Sarah Bareilles' gorgeous song, Breathe Again, uh, for the season finale of Grey's Anatomy. So I hope you caught it. Um, If you're a Grey's fan, I I so love getting to record this song. It's so beautiful Um, and just really grateful to get to be a part of this season of Grey's. My friend Sharon Gerber played the cellos that you hear, and, and making music with her is, is truly one of my favorite things ever. Hope you guys like the song. Uh, it is available everywhere music is. All I have, all I need, he's the air we kill to breathe. Okay, okay, nine, you guys. Uh, I I can't even believe that we're here at the finish line of these Enneagram songs. Uh, And and honestly, as I wrote each of these songs, the overarching theme that I I kept being reminded of was being a person is hard. It's really, really hard. And honestly, I've never been more aware of it than when I was writing my own song, uh, my my Enneagram song, Nine. And being the best of ourselves or or even coming close, well, that that honestly feels nearly impossible. So writing these songs and these these stories of redemption reminded me that that yes, it is incredibly difficult work to find our footing in any sense of redemption. But the ability to see the best in each other has to be at least a key. I'm reminded often of this beautiful quote by my friend Bob Goff. Instead of telling people what they want, we need to tell them who they are. This works every time we'll become in our lives whoever the people we love the most say we are. There is such deep and beautiful truth in that. And these Enneagram songs are are my attempt to underline what makes each of us good and beautiful. And and now shining that same kind of hopeful light onto myself and my type, I'll be totally honest, that resulted in one of the hardest songwriting challenges and probably emotional challenges I've ever faced. Today's episode is is all about that. It's it's about writing this this final Enneagram song and which kind of broke me open in, in a good way. 
uh, and what I realized about myself in the process of writing this song and, and what it actually means to, to be a type nine. Or maybe a better way of putting it is what it means to actually own being a type nine. So let's go ahead and begin. With each of these Enneagram podcasts, it has been such a privilege to get to be joined by my friend Chris Hewart, who is the author of The Sacred Enneagram and is the reason that I know anything about the Enneagram in the first place. So Chris is with us again, and we're going to talk about all things type nine. And uh, so Chris, thank you so much, as always, for uh, for being a part of this podcast and just for being a friend and just being an amazing person. Man, Ryan, thank you so much for including me in this and uh, your your journey and your process you know, we've talked about this, like, I'm so bummed that this is the final type podcast that we'll do together. These have been lots and lots of fun. And I know, man, the feedback from your community has just been overwhelming. And uh, so hopefully we don't disappoint the nines today who have allegedly been waiting for a quick minute for this. That's right. I I, I feel... I feel for the nines. However, I am a type nine. So I, uh, I also feel like it's okay that it's taken this long. <laughs> and I hate to say this to the other, other eight types, but, um, having heard you play the song a couple times, um, it, it, it really is maybe the strongest of all nine songs and it's great. You're, you're yeah. finishing on a high note and you're, you're wrapping all this up together. So if you're nine out there and you've been patiently waiting or just waiting or if your patience has worn thin and you finally have experienced your anger, um, I hope you know it's <laughs> been well worth the wait. Like this, this really is a, a piece of magic. So, oh man, thank you. Seriously, I'm deeply honored. This is all just a long form uh, plan to to get nines in touch with their anger. <laughs> and I think it worked. Actually, I think I was sort <laughs> I of did. tracking some of the so. social media love that you were getting and. Uh, it sort of looked like these guys might have been leaning into their eight wing a few times, <laughs> but it's it's amazing song. So Thank thanks you. for for including me in all these podcasts. Um, this has been a ton of fun working together with you on this. And uh, honestly, these songs are our true gift. And oh, really, I, I I mean this. These songs, and I think what you've done with these podcasts are some of the the best content out there. And you know this for maybe centuries, the enneagram was was an oral tradition. Of course, this is before the Enneagram of personality, but as an oral tradition, of course, um, there are things that can only be sort of transmitted in conversation and you see how a lot is lost when it's written on the page. And so, um, I even think in terms of what you've done here, you've honored the sort of ancient roots of, of this process teaching. Oh man, thank you. That is seriously, that is incredibly kind and, uh, it means, means the world coming from you. So since this is the the final song in my Enneagram series, I, I'm going to go ahead and assume that most folks listening to this uh, have at least some sort of familiarity with the Enneagram. Uh, and for those of us that are maybe less familiar with each of the types and the specifics, w- would you mind giving us kind of an overview uh, of who exactly these Enneagram type nines are? And uh, I guess another way of asking is, who who am I? Yes. So nines, there, there's the possibility that actually all of the nine Enneagram types, the eight other types are, are simply diminished versions of the nine, that the nine is the archetype of all human character structure. And, and that's sort of shown on the drawing of the Enneagram because the nine sits there at the top. The nines are sometimes called the peacemakers, the, the mediators, um, the, the arbitrators, They're incredible at sort of seeing every angle, every position, every uh, opinion, and and being able to sort of discern and and make sense of it. They understand people's positions almost better than we understand our own. And this is what makes an Einz an incredible arbitrator or or a referee. There's a a kind of peacefulness that that just really supports this strength, this, this, this sort of hunkered down what maybe is sometimes misunderstood as sort of a meandering or or stubborn strength of the nine. But this, this, this piece is really the, I think the hallmark there. And and this piece causes nines to to have sort of an unfortunate relationship with their own anger. And and so that may be repressed. Um, There's a kind of serenity that comes with the nines. There's a kind of drawing attention to the very things that, that make them comfortable and, and, and actually prioritizing those things and indulging in those things, maybe overdoing those things in a way that sort of becomes a, a kind of narcoticized checking out. 
there's a, a kind of, of diminishing of self that takes place in, in the mind of the nine. And this is because the nine is a source of love in the Enneagram. And, and that's their, their holy idea, holy love. And in a sense, they, they at an early age get these hints or these clues or these maybe some immense information about what love is. And then looking at themselves, what they want, what they they desire or they need, that seems selfish. And so they even sort of minimize those things as a way of trying to to put love forward. The thing about the nines is is there's a kind of of blending energy here. It's it's as if they can absorb almost everything, internalize it and, and give it back to you in a very similar way that, that you had given it to them or in a very similar way that they received it. And this blending is, is, is really the life force and, and the driving energy of the nines. There's a sense that nines are, are for the most part unjudging, but I'm going to say this. I, I think the sort of judgment that they do process through mentally sort of happens behind the scenes. It goes on sort of as the sort of subtext that they keep to themselves. You know, it's often said that nines have a tendency to lose themselves by, by merging with others. And again, I, I don't know that that's a, an accurate portrayal of what the nine is attempting to do. I think what the nine is really attempting to do and these, these merging kinds of, of hinges that they, they fortify in relationships is just self-deferential. It's, it's, it's making the other, the, the, the subject rather than objectifying anything about them. And, and again, it's, it's kind of the reach of love that the nine offers, now, what you you love about nines is their sort of even temperedness, their their sort of consistency and, and steadiness, and, and their range of emotions is is pretty limited. Though they experience these emotions viscerally, because nines are are in the body center, and and so if you remember these three centers of intelligence, the the head, the heart, and the body, these show us our um, primary mode of of perceiving reality and and, and then relating to reality. And and the nines relate to their reality, to their instincts. They relate to reality through their their gut, just sensations. Now, you remember this about the body types. Their most accessible emotion is anger. And and this is one of the things that sort of throws us about nines is they generally aren't angry. They, they, They actually do a super great job of repressing that anger and hiding it from themselves. But I kind of feel like what that is, is they've just sort of buried this sort of line of violation, this sort of guitar string of, of, of frustration that if and when it's ever found and if and when it's ever plucked sort of releases in, in kind of an explosive means of getting it off their chest, this really, really intense eruption of anger, but then it's hidden again from them. They feel really bad about it and, 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 and they go back to sort of maintaining peace, almost peace at, at any any price. Uh, so Chris, w- when you first introduced me to the Enneagram a bunch of years ago, uh, something you said stuck with me uh, when I was asking you the, the, like the basic questions of how, how does one figure out what type they might be? Uh, and you essentially said that as you read and learn about each of the nine types, uh, which everyone hurts the most is, is probably your type. And honestly, it, it, you know, all these years since, uh, everybody I know has had that experience as they figured out which type they identify with. Uh, it, it's a super heavy and, and kind of earth shattering moment for, uh, for folks learning about their type, uh, which is why I'm super embarrassed to admit that I never really had that experience until writing the song. Uh, I learned all about the type nine and, and thought, absolutely, that's a thousand percent me. And, and I realize now, of course, uh, this many years later, that I was essentially studying the Enneagram of, of not nine types, but of only eight. I was, I was reading and hearing everything uh, that was offered to me about the, the type nine. And it all made sense to me and explained so much about who I am. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that I, I wasn't really letting any of it sink in until, uh, as I said, I wrote this nine song. Uh, so is, is that a typical type nine experience when, when learning about the Enneagram or is, is something wrong with me? So I, I, I will say you're right. Like I, I think in general, um, the first time you come across material about your type, there is a kind of of humiliation that that takes place on an egoic level, right? Because we've we spent our whole lives sort of tricking out, building out these masks to hide our truth, to hide our gifts, to hide our essence from ourselves, and, and we begin to over identify with these masks, and these masks, of course, become the, the sort of rails for personality. So 
when you take a test, when you read descriptions, when you type identify or self-identify type, almost without exception, there is a kind of kind of a, a defeatism. Like, oh man, am I really that predictable? Or are these things uh, that I've always kind of known about myself really true here? And and I think sevens are the exception in that they love it. Oh, I'm a seven. Look at me. Oh, this is amazing. I <laughs> I, I, I can be that. But I think nines sort of reach back to this emotional passion and and the passions the nine passions of the Enneagram are how our hearts thirst our or or experience the suffering of our disconnect from our essence and our fixations the nine fixations of the Enneagram types are how our minds mentally tell our hearts look that way of coping with this loss that way of suffering the pain of, of forgetting who you've always been makes sense keep doing it well, the nine jumps back into that, and, and the passion is sloth, and, and the fixation is is rumination. And, and the sloth isn't laziness. Nines actually aren't the laziest of the nine types. We're all lazy in nine different ways. It, it's a kind of self-forgetting. So, of course, when nines come across their, their Enneagram type the very first time, there's parts of themselves that you've minimized. There's parts of yourselves that you've repressed. There's parts of yourselves that you sort of folded the page on and closed the book, and 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 though you know it's there, have it brought into awareness. And, and and it isn't until nines actually really start to do the hard work of of getting their hands dirty in their own type structure that some of this is going to be jarring, that some of this might be a little unsettling, that some of this might actually lead to a wake up call for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope that any type nines that are listening will get that wake up call sooner than I did because I successfully avoided feeling and experiencing uh, my own baggage <laughs> uh, through the Enneagram uh, up until honestly a month ago. So we'll get into that in just a bit here uh, as this entire song is truly that story, that, that awakening in, in me and in my life. In just a minute here, we're going to hear that song. And uh, but before we do, let's. Uh, I would love to have Chris continue on uh, in this beautiful overview of Type Nine. The the so called childhood wound for the nine here is a wound of of sort of minimizing. So the holy idea, holy love, the Type Nine's virtue, right action. You you can see what's about to happen here. When when nines are are rooted and, and tethered to their center, when nines are grounded and, and awake. They actually take this notion of love and, and they put it in action and nothing can stop them. They, they are a source of, of love in the world. Well, in their early holding environments, there's something that, that may have presented itself and, and that could have been a, a need. So maybe your parents um, were having a tough go in, in their relationship and were splitting up or, or maybe should have split up. Maybe you were raised by a caregiver or a single parent and, and, and they were doing a really gracious job of, of sacrificing everything for you. But as a little kid, you intuited, man, this must be hard. Maybe you had a, a sibling with a, a special need or maybe there was um, some pronounced deficiency in your neighborhood or in your classroom. Whatever it was, as children, a lot of nine sort of looked at those things and with a tremendous amount of sensitivity and, and, and care, thought to themselves, well, hey, that's a lot more important than the things that are important to me or this relationship or this family member or, or this this need in, in my neighborhood or, or, or community or class actually is more important than almost anything that I need. And so in sort of trying to balance between your, your sort of early childhood notion of love and how you related to needs and, and, and wounds and deficiencies in your holding environment, what you decided to do subconsciously was to make what was important to you less important. You minimized it. You, 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 you didn't forget it. It's as if you wrote it down on a piece of paper and crumbled that piece of paper up and put it in your back pocket. You, you didn't throw it away. You kept it close to you. But you made what you wanted less important to everybody else, starting with yourself. You made your opinion less forceful or, or, or demanding to everybody else, starting with, with yourself. And in doing this, you began to sort of fall into this notion of, of, of self slumber, self forgetfulness. And that's really what the, the passion of sloth is, is getting at, right? Mm -hmm. Nines hold that sloth 
in their bodies as, as a kind of or a form of fatigue. You're, you're exhausted. You're doing everything to mediate, to, to harmonize, to, to knit together the world outside of you, and, and it's wearing you out. And so, yes, it looks like, man, your exhaustion looks like a, maybe a, a, a residue or, or a symptom of that sloth, but that's not really what's going on. Secondly, you take that, that notion of sloth and you bring it into your heart as a kind of lassitude. It's not apathy. You are not on on a base level lazy. This lassitude is a kind of emotional exhaustion. You have worn yourself out. You have taken your heart outside of your chest and, and, and tried to offer it to, to the people that you care for the most, again, as a way of harmonizing what's been fragmented there. And then you bring this, this, this self-forgetful sort of sloth into your head. And at the end of the day, because you've carried so much for everyone, because you've tried to see every position and every opinion and, 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 and validate all of it, there's a kind of mental numbness that just clicks in. And, and so there's a switch that flips. And this is why a lot of nines might sit down in, in front of the TV um, and binge watch Netflix on a school night or a work night. This is why a lot of nines actually just want to be left alone once they're in their chair once they're sitting on the sofa like once they're in bed it's like it doesn't matter who's calling or what they need that that numbness is is almost like a switch that once it's flipped is is not going to be a sort of reset until the nine is ready to sort of shake it off and and, and sort of get up and, and get back at it now so you'll you'll notice that the nine sits right there in the middle of its intelligence center, of, of the three body types, the three instinctive types. But because it sits in the middle, that means it doesn't have a wing outside of its instinctive center. And, and, and this is true, right? For the three, six, and nines, these are sometimes called the anchor points, um, the revolutionary types. These are the pragmatists of the Enneagram, very practical, sort of stick with what works. And, and it actually stays in flow. When three, six, and nines sort of team up and, and pair up and, and collaborate together, the, the practicality of their pragmatism is, is almost unstoppable. But because these wings on either side of the nine are still in the body, the nine lacks a kind of depth perception in terms of accessing its intelligence center, its intuitive sort of gut sense and gut intelligence. So what that means is the nine of all nine types is the most disconnected from its own body. And, and this is fortified by that, that, that emotional passion of, of sort of self-forgetfulness, falling asleep. So things like yoga or, 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 or things that get you into a fitness center or, or things that sort of actually are visceral experiences, um, like these sort of deprivation floating tanks that actually help nines attach to their body is, is a way of waking up. It's, it's a way of integrating your centers by actually drawing forward your Repress center, which happens to be the center of intelligence that the nine is parked in. So good. Thank you so much, Chris. We'll hear a bunch more from Chris throughout the episode. Let's, let's go ahead and listen to the song, the, the final page uh, in this Enneagram chapter of, of my Atlas project. Oh my goodness. I, I am deeply honored to get to share this song with you. Uh, I'm terrified, of course, to share it, and but I, I'm excited to tell you about how it came to be. Uh, and if you happen to identify as a type nine as well, I so hope that something in this song in, encourages you. I hope that you feel known and seen and, and valued. And, and I hope in the same way that this song is a reminder to myself of, of who I am, I hope that uh, this song could serve you in that same way uh, and could be this gentle nudge to I encourage you to wake up. Who am I to say what any of this means? I have been sleepwalking since I was fourteen Now as I write my song I retrace my steps Honestly, it's easier To let myself forget Still I 
check my vital signs Choked up by realness I've been less than half myself For more than half my life Wake up worth fighting for you'll see another domino falls either way I'm just trying to find myself through someone else's eyes. So show me what to do to restart this heart of mine. How do I forgive myself for losing so? much time wake up roll up your sleeves there's a chain reaction in your heart muscle man So in writing this song, I experienced both of the very opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of the writing process. Uh, on one hand, it was one of the most effortless and natural songs I've ever written. Uh, and I just really enjoyed working on it. And then, of course, I hit a major brick wall and it ended up being the most difficult and, and personally challenging songs I have ever worked on. I actually began writing this melody uh, when I was working on my eight song. Uh, so when I should have been writing eight, I, I couldn't help but chase a few ideas down for, for nine. 
And so every day or so, I, I would sit down at the piano and, and play the start of, of the piano melody that you hear throughout. Um, and, and thinking about it now, I, I definitely approached writing this song uh, very much like a type nine approaches everything, kind of in, in the periphery. <laughs> I, I came at it from the side in, in a way. Um, so every day or so, I'd write one or two new notes into the melody. So it, it literally was that gradual uh, in, in the writing process. It was just one note at a time for, for months. And that was super fun. And uh, like I said, it was this kind of effortless portion of the writing uh, and the basic chords and notes just came together without really much struggle or, or pressure. Um, and it just felt really good working on it. Uh, and, and once my song eight was completed and I could actually focus entirely on just writing this song and, and diving in deep in my research of the type nine, that's when that brick wall completely showed up. Over the last year or so, lots of friends have asked me if I thought writing my song would, would be would be difficult or, or in some way easy. And I always kind of joked that every Sleeping At Last song is, of course, a type 9 song, since I am a type 9. But what was different about writing this song versus writing every other song I've ever written is... With all of my other music, I'm, I'm always striving, of course, to be a, as honest as I possibly can and to find some sort of thread of truth that I can I kind of explore and process through the music. Uh, I can be honest about one part of myself, but being honest about all of myself in a single song, as it turns out, is a very, very different type of challenge. So somewhere along the line, in my research of the Type 9, I realized that the brick wall that I was hitting wasn't because of my old friend Writer's Block. Uh, it was because there was no real honest way to write this song unless I truly owned and processed who I am. And the only way to do that was to be a level of honest with myself that I, I until now, have never been. Uh, and I didn't really know how to do that. Uh, it's not something I could just turn on and suddenly all of my you know, subconscious defenses w would fall to the floor. And so that was a real struggle because uh, everything I was reading and learning about felt true. It wasn't that it, like I didn't agree with it. It just felt like facts, like, okay, yes, it's true. I do everything I can to avoid conflict. Uh, it's true. I, I merge into the opinions of others because I, in that moment of conversation, I, I see their point of view. It makes sense to me. I also can see that I'm, you know, self-forgetting. I, I, I saw all of those things as just these really separate facts, and but I didn't really know what to do with them or what they meant as a whole. So I was at this just really strange impasse because I, I felt like I was being open and honest with myself uh, as I was learning about the type. But I also had this feeling that I, I just, something wasn't absorbing and I needed to figure that out, which of course is much easier said than done. I kind of like thinking about these these Enneagram songs as, as sort of mirror songs. Uh, like if I do my job decently, a, a listener would be able to see some sort of reflection of themselves, uh, what, is, what is deeply good and, and beautiful about them. Uh, at least that's the hope. And, and I've probably said this a hundred times now, but, but these Enneagram songs are, are written as nine stories of redemption. Uh, and this probably sounds a lot sadder than I, I want to admit. Uh, I had a really, really hard time seeing my own redemption. So I looked to the other type nines in my life and, and I saw the, the, what was good and amazing in them, but it kind of felt exclusive to them. I could look at the type nine objectively and, and write from that perspective, but by doing so, there'd be a major blind spot, which, which I think would produce a, a pretty dishonest song. Uh, and I realized that in my writing of the eight other songs, it, it wasn't just an observational look at other people. It, it was recognizing bits and pieces of myself in the struggle of every type and, and really seeing the beauty and the gifts of the people I know and love. So though I was writing about types that are not my own, I was able to, to be honest and, and personal in those songs by feeling and relating to everything I was learning about those types. So I, I decided to ask on social media, like what, for anybody that identifies as a type nine or is in relationship with a type nine, what do you think their greatest strengths are? Um, kind of in hopes of just maybe unlocking something that I was overlooking or ignoring uh, about myself. As I was paging through the responses to that question, what is the type nine superpower? Uh, I noticed that Almost every response was the word empathy or some answer directly connected to empathy. Uh, and I sat with that for a couple of days and, and kind of scratched my head. Uh, honestly, my first thought was, oh, wow, almost everyone misunderstands the type nine. And that's, of course, not because I, I didn't believe that type nines were empathetic. Uh, we absolutely are. But 
I have a suspicion that maybe a lot of like the empathetic actions that we show uh, are often in favor of just keeping the waters calm. So we don't have to necessarily face problems or conflict. So um, hearing that empathy w was people's idea of, of maybe like the superpower of the type nine, I just wasn't sure about that. And uh, in passing in a conversation with my mom, I mentioned that uh, I asked this question on Instagram and I was really surprised by the answers and kind of was processing like, yeah, I'm not sure if that's something that I, I really resonated with. And um, uh, her response was that as a kid, that was absolutely true of me. And, and she carried on and told me a few different stories of why she believed that. And, and the side note, she's a really great mom. So as the day went on, I was thinking a lot about what she said, and uh, there was there's a bit of heaviness that started to kind of set in. I just kept thinking that if if that was true of me when I was younger, and and now I I barely recognize that part of me, um, something something is kind of missing. Something's kind of um, I don't know. Something something's maybe broken or not working, and of course there is because we are all nine different versions of being broken. But uh, that is kind of embarrassingly, you know, multiple years after uh, diving headfirst into the Enneagram and trying to learn everything that I possibly could about it. That was like my first moment of peeling back the the layers of, of the ways in which I am broken. And so I called my Enneagram superstar, Chris, and uh, I told him about the question on Instagram and, and the responses that I got. Uh, and I mentioned my theory that, you know, maybe it looks like empathy because we just want everybody to be okay so as not to disrupt our universe. And so I said to Chris, is everyone right? Is, is empathy actually the gift of the type nine? And his answer was, well, yeah, it totally is. However, it's super tricky because in order to have whole empathy towards others, you have to empathize with yourself. Man, I, I thought about that for a moment and, and all of a sudden I, I find myself doing everything I could to hold back tears. And we got off the phone and you know how in movies when a character suddenly has like an epiphany and you see this montage of everything coming together. That is exactly how I felt. Just like that, like everything that I had learned over these several years about the Enneagram and the Enneagram Type 9 specifically suddenly all makes sense. All, like all of the dots were connected. And, and that realization was first that, like, no, I absolutely don't have a lot of empathy for myself, and that sucks. But the, the reason for that is because I – and, and I realize this is super heavy-handed in the, in the cliché department. But I realized that at some point in my life, I began to gradually power down my heart. Like, I never, I never really turn it off, just sort of put it in some kind of, like, standby mode. But it was almost like the, the volume was turned down on my heart. Like it got quieter and quieter so slowly that I, I didn't really notice in, until now, you know, 2019. And I've been talking about empathy, but it, it's been about my heart. And once I realized that, like I said, it felt like a million confusing pieces of my life like suddenly fell into place. Uh, and that was equal parts so beautiful and really, really heartbreaking. So I, I immediately replayed all the biggest moments of my life through this this new lens, this new realization. And I kind of felt like the room was spinning because there's just so much to process. And the first thing that kind of broke me open in, in the best way possible w was thinking about my daughter, Lily. Um, when she was born, uh, that first year of being a dad, I was so over the moon in love and and overjoyed to get to to be a dad. And at the same time, I had this this really strangely difficult year and I couldn't figure out why because nothing was nothing was obviously wrong um, and embarrassing after years of trying to figure out what was going on in my head I, I landed on uh, I thought it was like this time management thing like like I was just stressed out about how much was needing to get done and being a new dad uh, you know I was tired and meant that the margins were slimmer and I was just spread a little thin, um, and I'm sure there was there was a little truth to all of that. Of course, that's that's what parenting is, but that's not that's not what was going on. Uh, what was going on was that this perfect human being was born, and I got to be her dad. And, and and after all of those years of nudging my heart to the back seat, this little kid laying in my arms, like without saying a single word, told me that there's there's absolutely no way to be a dad and to keep my heart in the background. So without knowing it, uh, there was this, this crisis of vulnerability going on inside me. Uh, and so over that following year, I was just kind of 
figuring out new ways to do both, keep my heart in the background and push it forward for my daughter. And that was really, really hard. And of course I had zero clue that any of this was going on in my life. I just, I just knew that there was this, this kind of tug of war going on inside me. Um, but I didn't know why. And, uh, and by the time my daughter Iris was born a couple of years later, I, I think I had already figured out some sort of internal truce with my heart. Kind of like I, I figured out how to use my heart for my family, for my for my girls, but I, I, I still kind of kept it under lock and key for the, <laughs> the other parts of my life. So I kept going further back in my life to try to figure out when this change happened, or, or at least when it began. And, and I think it started quietly when I was about 14 years old. Uh, I had my first kind of glimpses into the, the scariness of growing up. Um, some, some real life difficult things were happening dangerously close to me. And, and I think I subconsciously began to, to process or reorganize how my heart operated in my life. Uh, and of course, this happens to all of us in, in one way or another uh, as we stumble into adulthood. But 14 was this really significant age in my life as I as I thought back on it for a lot of reasons. Not only was it the age that I can point to as to when this whole heart rearranging began, but it was also the year I began writing songs. So really, it, it's the beginning of Sleeping at Last. And as I was thinking about this, I, I thought it was super ironic that my music has been this emotional, heart-forward music from the start, uh, because that's the kind of music that I fell in love with. Uh, as I've said before, the first time I heard a song that could make the hair on my arms stand up, it, that just felt like magic to me. I just I just couldn't believe how, how could something invisible cause like a physical reaction. So ironically, from 14 onward, I've spent my life making heart forward music. Uh, and at the same time, accidentally turning down the volume of, of my heart in my life. And the more I think about it, I think the reason for that is that music is this incredibly safe and natural space for me uh, to express and, and process my heart. Uh, and it feels like like therapy to me, uh, which I think is, a, of course, a really good thing. But I also think it, it somehow over the years has probably given me like a secret permission to keep my heart protected in my life and, and vulnerable in my music. And, and making music has probably helped me to not only stay in touch with my heart, but it also probably gave me the impression that I am in touch with my heart in, in all areas of my life. Um, therefore, I never really asked myself any of these big questions until now. Uh, so in a way, Sleeping at Last is where I feel more myself, or at least more more my true self. And knowing that also makes sense of why so much of who I am and my identity is, is so inseparable from my music. And that's, of course, not not all bad, and it's also not all good. So I'll, I'll be figuring out the the balancing act for that for the rest of my life, I'm sure. So because of all this subconscious turning down of my heart all these years, uh, I can look back and, and see all of these, these strange kind of hidden techniques that I've put in place in my life, like these, these defense mechanisms. For example, I, I have a really hard time letting compliments in. Uh, I deflect them at like pro levels and I've learned how to, how to receive them on a, on a surface level. And I know how to respond to them in gratitude. And they do mean so much to me when I receive kindness, uh, but it's, it's really hard for me to let it sink in beyond that, that surface level. And it's almost like a, like a discount program I have. Anytime someone gives me kindness or, or nurture or love, I, I think, well, you're probably just saying that to be polite, or maybe it's just, you like bad music <laughs> or, um, for my family, uh, of of course you're saying that I'm your son, you know, and I realize now to truly receive kindness, uh, that would be an opening of my heart. And that is absolutely terrifying and uh, in direct conflict with the, with these kind of mechanisms that I've built over the, the course of these many, many years. And all of this is is like a micro example of what I uh, realized about my daughter being born. These are these are invitations for my heart to to fully come alive, and that's really scary. Uh, and I didn't know that until now. So it should go without saying, but realizing all of this in my life uh, encouraged some really good tears. It's ironic too because my my daughter asked me a couple weeks prior to writing this song if I ever cry and and I said oh of course I do you know everyone cries sometimes and then she said well I've never seen you cry and I wasn't sure why but that conversation made made me a little bit sad because I felt like maybe I was I was failing at showing my daughter what a wholly emotional person looks like uh, and that conversation made me think about the fact that I I don't cry very often uh, and I rarely even tear up. 
Um, and of course, now I know that that's, that's all just a symptom from this, this kind of turning down of my heart. But it, it kind of stopped me in my tracks when she said that. And so I guess that was kind of the beginning of, of this realization for me. And, and it's funny, too, because I, I was I was kind of thinking back on, on the different moments in the past several years that I that I have cried or I have teared up. And uh, they were at the births of both of my daughters. And um, of course, like I said, that was like this this invitation for my heart to to show up. And um, that brought on this kind of flood of emotions. And then the other less, you know, significant moments in my life, I always tear up watching Pixar and Disney films. And if, if you know much about me, you know that I have a, a deep love and passion for all things Disney and Pixar. Um, and I think what it is, and of course, I know this is not an exclusive experience to me because this is the point of Disney. Um, they they connect you to your heart. Pixar and Disney help me remember my true self. They help me remember my childhood when I was my true self. Uh, and these these stories that they tell, they they break me open. They really do. They they uh, I keep using the analogy of my turning the volume down on my heart. Well, Pixar and Disney films turn the volume way up for a couple hours, and it's this really beautiful experience for me, because in most other areas of my life, I'm I'm I keep the tears held back, and um, Pixar and Disney give me permission to access them. And in thinking about all this, it also dawned on me why I felt so tired for all these years, and and have been for as long as I can remember, just just worn out in one way or another. Uh, and I've realized, for me, my my generally worn out state of mind is because keeping the waters of my life and, and my relationships calm and, and okay is so exhausting. It is so tiring, and uh, my obsession with not rocking the boat, with with equilibrium, has a price, and it has worn me out. In my research, I came across a video of Father Richard Rohr uh, talking about the Type 9, and he said something that I just thought was super funny and, and kind of perfect. He said that a 9 is sort of always in this mode of thinking that, why stand when I could sit, and, and why sit when I could lay down? <laughs> and I just, I think that's perfect. Um, a side note, another awesome quote I saw that I just felt like was a perfect nine meme um, was don't give up on your dreams keep sleeping <laughs> and I, I think those are super funny and they definitely underline uh, the caricature of of the type nine but honestly on a, on a serious note uh, as Chris mentioned earlier in the episode when you read about the type nine you'll see the word sloth and, and sometimes even the word lazy attached to the type and, and that language feels so wrong to me it feels so off um, not because I I just didn't want to own being worn out and lazy but because as Chris said it's it's a misunderstanding it, all the type nines that I know are incredibly productive people and, and I think I am too but as I said I, I think it's just so incredibly exhausting for the type Type nines to take the ups and downs of life and and constantly compress it and keep those waters calm. And there's some really beautiful aspects of that. That's that's the peacemaking part of the type nine that I think is uh, part of that that empathetic gift that we talked about earlier. But it's it's not a sustainable way to be fully alive. Uh, there's there's a time and a place for keeping the waters calm, and then there's also a lot of times in life when the water is not supposed to be calm, and that's okay too. Uh, and to be totally fair, I, I'm sure that the language of laziness or sloth like bothers me because it reminds me that there is this aspect of my life of like this lack of emotional engagement that could totally be called laziness. I mean, without any conscious effort, uh, putting putting my heart in that backseat role, that is, that is a form of laziness. I mean, because it's easier. It's easier to not experience everything through your heart and be opened up to all of the potential hurts and brokenness that could come from being vulnerable, you know? So sure, that, that word is not kind, but at the same time, um, I, I understand why it gets uh, assigned to to us type nines. But overall, we are not lazy people. We get a lot done. Uh, and it takes a ton of work to hold everything together, even though we're, we're definitely not holding everything together. <laughs> we just want to. But it, it takes a lot to pursue that desire, you know? So in, in all of the stuff that I've been realizing, I, I kept having this, this image of a, a massive table with countless rows of dominoes on it. 
all lined up kind of weaving in and out of each other. Uh, and I think that every relationship and every decision in my life is its own row of dominoes on that table. Some rows are super short and some rows are so long that I can't see where they end. And these dominoes are all there and I'm supposed to choose which ones I will engage with and which ones I will kind of see through. And this is super scary for me because though I can see how some of the dominoes will fall in my life, uh, most of the time I just have no idea and, and I have to just choose. And, and one of my subconscious tricks that I've developed is to, to shrink the row of dominoes uh, the best I can. So let's say one of the rows of dominoes is, is a relationship and uh, each domino in that row is an opinion or, or a choice of theirs or mine. Uh, well, I, I've learned to shrink that row of dominoes by by eliminating my my opinions or, or my wants or desires. And I've convinced myself that by removing my own dominoes from the row, I will somehow eliminate some of the variables. It gives me this this false impression that I, I, I will actually understand how things will land. The relationship becomes a, a lot simpler just to focus on the needs and wants and desires of the other person rather than my own. Uh, and this is, of course, a total classic nine self-forgetting move. And it's not selfless. It's it's actually kind of a form of control because I'm, I'm scared of there being too many dominoes and that row being so long and being unsure of how it all land. I'm, I'm showing up with less of myself in order to gain more safety or, or a sense of safety. And in addition to that problem of, you know, not bringing my full self forward into the relationships, there's also the problem of this whole plan being just entirely a false sense of security at its core. The, the thing with the dominoes, they're going to fall either way. And we don't get to know how, why, when, and that's totally terrifying and amazing and everything in between. I'm short selling myself and, and the people I love by by this idea of constantly trying to shrink these uh, each of these beautiful rows of dominoes in my life. Something I read and deeply resonated with recently was Helen Palmer's writing on the type nine. Uh, she says, saying no to another person can feel as disappointing to nines as being denied something in their own lives. And that's so true. The, the idea of letting someone down is far worse in my mind than someone letting me down because I can control those dominoes if I'm let down. I know where my disappointment lands, but, uh, but letting someone else down is, is different. I don't know where that leaves the relationship. So it means that I, I pull myself out of that equation and I, I I, I say a lot of hopeful yeses uh, just to keep things okay uh, because a yes feels like a manageable outcome uh, even if it's not the thing I want and and a no saying no feels like an uncontrollable amount of variables for potential conflict or, or disappointment. Uh, and I'm sure you already guessed the irony is that by by saying yes to things that you don't want to do all the time, not only leads to resentment, but it, it also leads to conflict down the road. So it, it doesn't even do the the main thing that it's supposed to do, which is to to help us avoid disappointment and conflict. It just it just prolongs it. And I also realized, as I believe is probably a type nine commonality, uh, sometimes I get real weighed down by making decisions. I'm getting better at it, and it's something I, I try to work on. But it's it's a real it's a real pain in the butt. And I'm when I'm not in a good place, it, it gets kind of out of control, and I'm I'm stuck in limbo on a decision for a long time, weighing the pros and cons of everything. And I, I realize that when I do that, I'm essentially pressing pause on interacting with these dominoes at least I think I am. Again, I think that there's this subconscious machinery that is tricking myself into thinking that somehow by not deciding the dominoes just aren't going to fall. Even though I hate that space of indecision, it gives some sense of peace that these dominoes have not yet fallen. Uh, again, the problem is uh, they always fall. And, and my choice to be indecisive is completely a choice uh, and usually a very, very, very poor one at that. But for a second, I get to feel like the dominoes are there in my sight line. And I, I suppose sometimes I'm hoping that a new piece of information or will, will kind of decide for me or, or just make that decision a little easier. Maybe maybe an accidental bump to my table of dominoes will come. <laughs> but that's, that's not ideal. Uh, we get this privilege of choice, and, and I'd like to honor that privilege by participating in it in a healthy way. So to state the super obvious, all of this stuff is what this song is about, this, this experience. Uh, and the song required a, an opening up in me and a depth of honesty with myself that I've avoided, whether intentionally or not, for literally most of my life. And you just can't force those types of realizations either. So obviously that was a, a challenge in the beginning. So when this series of realizations kind of broke me open, 
I was so relieved and grateful to finally understand the path forward, not only in my life and the work I need to be doing to put my heart where it belongs, but in the direction of the song. Um, of course, the song needed to be about this experience. Uh, and that sounded so clear and super simple. Uh, and I kind of hoped that the lyrics would just kind of overflow out of this experience and, and out of me. And um, it was totally wrong, completely wrong, uh, as an immediate reminder that the work <laughs> was still needing to be done. Um, that This is when I hit my, my second kind of large brick wall in the writing of this song, because I, I couldn't figure out how to put words to what I had experienced and felt and understood about myself. And so it, so it took a long time for me to, to feel okay about it. And as I was finally nearing the finish line of this song, I... I still had this like uncertainty, um, and I always do, of course, at letting go of any creative thing I've worked on is has always been a challenge, and I've talked a little bit about that. But for this one, uh, my wife my wife mentioned to me, uh, I was telling her, I'm like, I, I think I'm done, I'm just not sure. She's like, would you, would you know if you were done? And the honest answer to that is no, prob probably not. Um, but... I did have a, a small gut that it, it, it was it was finished, and so I, I decided that it would be it would be fun to play this song live a few times um, because I knew it's such an intimate song. I knew the piano and the vocal were kind of needing to be recorded at the same time, and they also I just needed the practice and I needed the the comfort of of knowing the song as much as I was able. And uh, so I played it at a, a few different events. I played it at my friend Chris's Enneagram event here in Chicago. Uh, and before that, I played it at an event in Nashville for the, the Q conference. Uh, and all of that ended up being really good for me because in one particular show that I was about to play, I, I remember I was, I was waiting backstage to, for the event to begin. And I just had tons of nerves building up. I was I was really stressed out, and that's not unique in any way because I'm a nervous performer. Period. I I just get really nervous about playing things wrong or not serving these songs in the way that I hope or or know that I'm capable of. Anyway, I was backstage about to play these songs at, at the event in Nashville and feeling so stressed out about performing. And suddenly I just had this little this little moment of like, all right, what of all the stuff that I've been realizing? How do I how do I put this into action? And I just I realized that the most important thing I can do is to remind myself that I love these songs. I love the music that I get to play. I love that I get to pursue this passion in my life. And so I just kind of had that little mantra going into my head as I was performing. You love these songs. You love these songs. And it really helped. So when it, when it came time to play nine for the very first time, I was, of course, shaking. I was very, very nervous. But I feel like it solidified the the finality of this song. Like playing it in front of people for the first time made me hear it through other people's ears. And that was a really healthy and I think good thing for me to do. And it wasn't like I suddenly decided I thought it was good. It was just I, I suddenly recognized it as a part of myself and as a really vulnerable part of me that I, I should honor by being proud of. Um, and so... That kind of gave me the closure that I needed. So immediately after performing it, I, I booked a, a studio in Chicago called Electrical Audio, which has been the home of a lot of my earlier recordings. I love working there. I usually record at home nowadays, but um, they just have this really, really special place. So I knew that because I wanted to record this song as vulnerably as I possibly could and without any distractions and without any noise or, or restarts because of, you know, any crying kids in the background or any of that kind of thing, I knew that I just needed one focus day to just play through this song and record it. I booked that studio because I knew that it, not only was it time to let go of this song, but it felt right. It finally felt right. And so that's what you hear is the, the piano and vocal were recorded live uh, at Electrical Audio and engineered by Taylor Hales. And that day was really meaningful um, as, a, as a sense of closure uh, in the song. So even though I have been talking forever, uh, I actually still have a ton to share with you guys about um, specific lyrics and uh, all the fingerprints that you hear throughout the song and some of the choices that I've made. Um, and we'll get to all of that. Um, but I did want to hear uh, a little bit more from Chris about the type nine. I feel like now that I've shared my my type nine story, my, my realizations, seven years or whatever in the making. <laughs> so now it feels like a good moment to uh, return to an actual expert talking about the, the Enneagram type nine so once again here is chris hewitt's the placement of the nine on the circle like like i said at the top um i i think has some real significance and some real weight in terms of what 
it's telling in terms of the story of the nine. So I image it like this, right? My my ribs sort of come off, let's say my spinal cord. And, and this is kind of what's happening with the other eight types. They're falling from the most intense eight and one, which are the nine swings, all the way down to the sort of most detached and withdrawn, the four and five there at the bottom of the circle, the guardians of that existential hole. Like I said, we're, we're just diminishing versions of the nine sort of falling off either side. In the old days, Claudio Naranjo, right, the, the grandfather of Enya types, um, used to say that if you drew a vertical line in, in, in the middle of the circle of the Enneagram, that the types to the right, right, ones, twos, threes, and fours, would contain maybe more of the feminine energies of, of the nine types, and the types to the left, eight, seven, six, and fives, would contain maybe more of the masculine energy of the Enneagram types. I, I sort of think that the nine sort of looks at that and says, nah. There's no male nor female going on here. We're not going to gender all this. And it's as if the nine sort of reaches its arms out and, and embraces the entire circle, embraces all the other eight types and, and brings them together. And actually sort of in clasping its fingers closes that gap at the bottom of, of the circle. There really is a wholeness. There really is a kind of unity that that comes from the nine. And, and so if the nine actually is the source of all types, and the source of love, we see that. It's as if all the other eight types are, in a sense, thirsting to sort of even come home to what was lost as we fell down either side of the circle, losing a, a bit of our, our groundedness and, and losing our, our, our contact with love. As a, as a nine, I'm, I'm feeling really good about this podcast so far. <laughs> Just kidding. So tell me more about um, one of the funny things about nines is is the just sort of low key, sort of affable, um, accepting. Like I said, this sort of kind of non judging approach to relationships. But the 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 thing that really throws me, and I think is maybe one of the sweetest, is their unfortunate sort of proximity to their own anger. And you see, it's the nine's anger where they actually learn to practice discernment. It's the nine's anger where they actually connect with their body. It's the nine's anger that actually wakes them up from this slumber. So, of course, I didn't know about this when I was a little kid, nor did my my, my brothers. But as adults, I, I think my father is a nine. And, and man, I mean, he's one of the coolest guys out there. Super laid back, strong. There's a kind of determination there, but there's a real subtlety. And there's a real sort of even keeledness about him. And so when we were kids, we used to play this game to see who could make my dad get angry. And as soon as the game was on, we'd start messing with this guy, busting his chops, um, giving him hell. And we'd just pick at him and and, and provoke him. <laughs> and, and like nines, long-suffering, patient, accommodating, he would take it and he would take it and he would take it. And this would go on for two or three, sometimes four days. And when my dad finally got angry, it came flying out like this. Damn it. And that was it. And then he felt so bad about it that he hit his anger. And as soon as he hit his anger, me and my brothers are like, game on. And we started at him again. Now, as an adult, I'm just like, man, these poor nines, they just, they do take it and they take it and they take it. And, and it's kind of a superpower. I mean, it's almost like the Black Panther sort of tricked out costume. It's like they internalize all these blows, all these impressions. And in a sense, it's making them a little bit stronger, but slowly, slowly what it's doing is waking up to their anger. And finally, when they let it out, like I said, it it, it can be abrupt. It can be super clumsy. They're going to feel really, really bad about it. But then if they don't hold that anger and let it help them grow in discernment, if they don't hold that anger and actually help them tell themselves the truth about what's hidden behind that anger, the sadness, the hurt, but you know, continue to repress it, Again, they're fortifying that passion, that emotional ability to just continue to fall asleep to themselves, to minimize, to diminish, to not make what's important to them important to the world that they inhabit. That's really good, except for the part where you're messing with your dad. <laughs> you guys owe him an apology. 
but yeah, I have a long, long, long way to go in terms of being in touch with my anger. It is, it is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Uh, but we'll take a quick side note here because um, it reminded me of this amazing fingerprint that my my friend TJ Hill sent me. Uh, we'll talk about all the different fingerprints in the song. There are a lot, um, uh, but this one felt super appropriate to highlight here because it reminds me of that that super buried, deep seated anger that that us Type Nines experience. He calls it disintegration. And what he did was he pulled in audio from each of my Enneagram songs and uh, stretched them out and kind of overlap them in a way that just sounds so, so scary. Uh, so here, here's that sound. <laughs> it's so great. Thank you so much to TJ. TJ is, by the way, a, a composer out in L.A. and just a really great human being and such a such a talented songwriter so thanks for such a cool sound that sound is in the song um so there is some deep-seated anger <laughs> some disintegration throughout this type nine song uh and it was fun because i originally the way i was going to handle like the that end of what i was learning about the type nine that that kind of buried anger was to have like kind of a moment or two in the song that just had like extreme dissonance and but as the song took shape i just i didn't feel like it was the right thing to do uh to to this song so his fingerprint was the the perfect uh the perfect fill-in for that because I, I i still was able to get all of that dissonance and that intensity but um have it in a really really subtle way as a fingerprint so super cool tj all right so chris carry on please okay so the basic fear for the nine and and of course this fear is 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 simply for all nine types the the fear that we're never going to get back to our true self to our essential nature to our our our, our purposed reason for being why our soul exists and and for the nine the the soul of the nine exists to be an embodiment of love in action right well the the fear here is is that the nines are are somehow cut off from that essence that there is a disconnectedness within them and and that disconnectedness within them really leads to the sense that they are about to lose themselves and if they lose themselves they lose everything so just like all of us in in nine different ways what we don't want to contend with inside we project outside the nine on a subconscious level not wanting to contend with that fear internally actually projects it and and that's why it looks like the nine is is a mediator or an arbitrator or peacemaker that's why it looks like the nine is trying to knit harmony in their external environments because it's simply a projection of them not having to face their fear of their inner disconnectedness their inner fragmentation and i'll tell you what when you really get under the hood of the nine's heart when you really get into their mind when you really ask them how they're doing and hold them to an answer You'll, you'll start to see a, a kind of trembling in what really leads to kind of a provocation of, of their frustration. They don't want to have to look inward. And in fact, their, their, their notion or their malformed sense of what it means to be a source of love makes them feel as if that's narcissistic or, or self-centered or, or egocentric. And, and so to mute any of that, to tamp all of that down is actually giving strength and, and, and it's feeding that fear. It's actually making that fear, that fear stronger. Oh man. Yeah. Well, that is the exact ton of bricks that I felt uh, throughout the the learning and researching and writing of this song was, uh, was me finally discovering that disconnect that you said, that, that disconnect with my heart. So thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're going to hear more from Chris in a little bit. And uh, I would love to talk to you more about uh, what went into the song. So before I wrote a single note or lyric in the song, I had a few general ideas inspired by the type nine that I wanted to explore in, in writing the song. Uh, and one of those ideas was to musically nod to nines merging. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, nines tend to blend in or merge with the opinions and, and ideas of whomever they're with in that moment. Uh, they're, they're agreeable. So I, I thought it'd be really fun to kind of make sure that the key of my nine song kind of merged into the key of the song before it. So you'll notice that my song eight and this song share the exact same key, and that is uh, just a subtle nod to, to merging. Here's a clip of eight. I want to break these bones till the better. I want to break them right and feel alive in a clip of nine. Wake up, fall 
So though eight and nine share the same key, I knew that they should also be total opposites. Uh, eight is intended to be abrupt and strong and, and kind of reflect the power of the type eight. And for nine, I wanted it to be really understated overall. And uh, at first I wanted it to sound hesitant and timid. And then uh, slowly over the course of the song and as the, the story of redemption kind of plays out, I wanted it to kind of come alive and uh, sound a little bit more confident and a little bit more uh, awake. So the very first lyrics of Nine are, are nearly a whisper. Who am I to say what any of this means? And the reason I chose to do that and have it just be a singular vocal is that I wanted it to be the exact opposite of how Eight ends. So Eight ends in this really, really, really abrupt and big way. It ends at its loudest point. And nine begins at its most intimate and, and quietest point. Who am I to say? So another idea that I wanted to play around with for this song was to write it primarily as a waltz. Uh, and there's just something about that time signature that felt agreeable, uh, kind of like nines want unity and partnership and the, the waltz sounds kind of like that to me. Uh, I once heard Father Richard Rohr say something to the effect of, um, if you've ever had a type nine over at your house, you might have noticed that they usually don't know when or how to end the evening. So they kind of meander in the conversation and even walking to the front door. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's pretty awesome. Um, and so my way of nodding to uh, to nines meandering was to kind of change back and forth between time signatures. So at first it's a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And then it's four, four timing. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And it kind of ebbs and flows uh, back and forth throughout. And I chose to allow the tempo of the song to always be shifting, so there's no click track or, or set tempo. So you'll notice um, the performance of this song, and I think the nature of this song, is kind of like a, a boat rocking on water. Uh, and all this was inspired by Ro Roar's comments uh, about nines and, and their meandering. <laughs> so then that rubato tempo also just felt like the, the perfect fit for, for the intimacy of this song. Uh, it needed to follow its own constantly shifting tempo. Uh, and, and probably the more meaningful reason that I chose to keep this song uh, just in its own tempo, just kind of constantly shifting, was because uh, if this song is about finding my heart, I, I really like the idea of that the tempo of this song was, was sort of searching for, for the tempo of, of my heartbeat. So for the overall tone of this song, I, I wrote down that this song should sound like a hybrid between a lullaby and a hymn. A lullaby because of the nine's sleepiness, and then a hymn because of the nine's desire for unity. Uh, with those ideas in mind, I tried to write something that felt almost like a traditional, like a, a combination of those two things, uh, a melody that I could repeat that sounds in some way familiar in its simplicity, but, but each time you hear it, maybe something new or surprising gets added into it. And that idea was a subtle nod to my, my not-so-stellar memory. <laughs> so I like the idea of every time the verse melody plays through, something new is being added to it. It's almost like uh, what we do with our actual memories. We, we constantly are filling in the gaps whenever our brain fail us and we, we can't remember something. And a side note on memory, uh, my research of the type nine taught me that it's not really just that I have a bad memory. It's actually kind of an unconscious choice to forget, which is which is part of the the whole self-forgetting that that nines are famous for. <laughs> so it's kind of just another way of minimizing or, or shrinking the row of dominoes. And you'll hear a couple references to my my poor memory uh, in the lyrics of the song. Uh, one line. Honestly, it's easier to let myself forget. And then later in the song, I, I sing. There's a chain reaction in your heart, muscle man. And that remembering who you are line is sort of the answer to the, the earlier lyric of it's easier to let myself forget. 
Another thing I knew that this song needed to be was was simple. Uh, I believe that simplicity is one of the one of the gifts of the Type Nine. And, and though it's something that I'm always a little bit personally insecure about, I'm I'm not smart enough. My my music is too simple. My ideas are too basic. But the more I learn about the Type Nine, uh, the more I realize that that simplicity or or the lack of of too muchness is actually what allows the Nines uh, to see objectively and, and in a kind of a unique way that can be really helpful. So I decided to keep this song as simple as possible with with only a few key ingredients. So there's there's voice. Who am I? There's piano. There's violins. And there's choir. And, and each of them are are kind of gradually layering uh, in one at a time slowly throughout the course of the song. So one idea I got really excited about was the addition of the high school choir that you just heard. Uh, my friend and, and, by the way, fellow nine, Bob Davidson, mentioned earlier this year to me that if uh, if I ever needed a, a young choir to record on anything, uh, that his daughter's high school choir was was really, really great. Um, this comment came in such a perfect moment because the song was just about starting to take shape, and, and I could instantly hear what a choir would sing in it. So he put me in touch with Andrew Jeffrey, who is the director of choirs at the uh, Glenbard West High School. And I was just so pumped to hear that the, the he and the kids were up for recording on my ninth song. So in addition to just absolutely loving choir, uh, what I really loved about this idea was that the song would start out a cappella with just with just me and and being a type nine. And then it would end in, in the, the young voices of every type. And Andrew was kind enough to translate the choir arrangement that I wrote to to fit the kids' voices so beautifully uh, and to transcribe the arrangement to sheet music. Uh, So I got to record nearly 50 absolutely amazing kids, uh, and being in that space, hearing them sing the arrangement all together for the first time was was such a beautiful moment, a true music highlight for me. In the arrangement, I wanted the voicings of the choir to to kind of tell the nine story of redemption uh, in moments throughout the song that are more hesitant in the lyrics or more um, kind of like the the processing end of the lyrics. I wanted the choir to sing a little bit more closed mouth, essentially humming their parts. Uh, And as the redemption of the story, the realization throughout the song, uh, the kids would slowly sing more opened up and and more full voiced and kind of moving from oohs to ahs. Again, the point being to emphasize the, the story arc of the song. So I can't thank Andrew and the incredible kids enough for for lending me their time and their beautiful voices. Uh, Their contribution to this song is such a gift, and I am so thankful that uh, after all of these Enneagram songs, we get to hear the voices of all nine types of a younger generation. Uh, A massive thank you to Andrew Jeffrey and the Glenbard West Choir for, for singing on this song. Oh gosh, I could listen to that all day. I think I've mentioned this in other episodes before, but I like to think of the stringed instruments uh, throughout each of these nine Enneagram songs uh, as as sort of a representation of the heart. So I knew that strings would play an important role in this song. And I also knew that my dear friend Kumiko Bankson is a type nine and also happens to be one of my favorite violinists ever. So uh, it was really, really fun to get to work with her again. She's been uh, somebody that I've recorded with a few times and I've gotten to tour with a little bit. She's an amazing person. And I'm just really, really thankful that we get to make more music together so she was sweet enough to take the arrangement that i sent over to her and uh, she recorded all of the gorgeous violins that you hear throughout this song
for both the the strings and the choir, I, I wanted to write arrangements that w would at different points sound like breathing. Uh, so the choir and the strings sort of inhale and exhale in and out of the song. Uh, and I like the idea of that as a reminder to myself to, to breathe deep. Uh, I really love this meditation app called Headspace, and, and I feel like that app taught me how to breathe better and deeper over these last couple of years. So I wanted something in this song to remind me to to pay attention to that in my life. So literally a few hours before I was wrapping up this song, I, I sent a, a text to my friend uh, Seth Richardson, who plays bass, um, and asked if he would be willing to uh, send me a fingerprint sound. And he wasn't sure exactly what he wanted to what he wanted to record. And I, I asked him, like, "Hey, would you would you be willing to play these three notes on your on your upright bass?" Uh, and he was up for it. And so he pressed record on his iPhone voice memos. And uh, so all of the bass that you hear is uh, my friend Seth Richardson. Thank you, Seth. So in the latter half of the song, I, I sing the lyrics, it looks like empathy to understand all sides, but I'm just trying to find myself through someone else's eyes. Right in that moment where I sing through someone else's eyes, you'll, you'll notice a new voice, and, and that is the voice of Alex G. It looks like empathy to understand all sides, but I'm just trying to find myself through someone else's eyes. An incredible singer-songwriter and just a really wonderful person who was kind enough to lend me her voice on this song uh, because I, I really, I thought it was important in that lyric, obviously uh, I'm saying through someone else's eyes to um, to have that harmony in there. So, so I'm really grateful to have Alex, a, a fellow type nine, uh, on this song. Someone else's eyes. So another reason that I was so excited to have Alex sing that harmony and the choir singing harmonies is that harmony is one of the, the gifts of the type nine. So it felt really important to have that represented in the music. So I'll, I'll point out a few more things in the lyrics that I wanted to kind of note. In the lyrics, Still I check my vital signs Choked up I I've been less than half myself for more than half my life. That is actually not only a reference to the very long story that I told earlier in this in this podcast and my realizations about being a type nine, truly for more than half my life, I haven't really been myself, uh, or at least I haven't been wholly myself. But it's also a reference to the Enneagram intelligence centers, the heart, the body, and the mind. The lyric, so I checked my vital signs, is a reference to the heart. Choked up is a reference to the body. And the lyric, I realized, is a reference to the mind. Uh, and th those lyrics are also a, a very, very subtle reminder to me personally, because uh, before I had all of these type nine realizations over this last few months, uh, I, I wanted to try something, which is to every day try to do something good for my heart, something good for my body, and something good for my mind. Which again, uh, looking back, I now see that when I was trying to figure out what that looked like, uh, like figuring out what I would do for my body is, of course, eating better or uh, getting some sort of exercise. And what I would do for my mind is, of course, uh, reading or uh, watching something like a documentary or some, some sort of learning. And the heart category was, was actually really hard for me to figure out like a, a tangible thing that I could do each day uh, outside of like the obvious, like uh, I'm, I want to spend really intentional time with my kids. Uh, so ironically, uh, the heart, even in that, in that attempt to better myself, the heart was kind of like, huh, I, I guess I'll figure that one out later. <laughs> Little did I know. Another thing I was trying to be intentional about is so the, the types three, six, and nine are, are called the revolutionary types, or sometimes they're called the anchor types. Uh, and there's a, a thread that I was intentional about, uh, which is that I wanted these songs to sound gentle and intimate and, and traditional. So if you listen to three, six, and nine, all three of those songs have something in common with one another. Because I wrote nine songs for the nine types, and because nines are, of course, always trying to mend things together, uh, I thought it'd be kind of fun to gently nod to each of the other Enneagram songs within the lyrics of nine. So I'll quickly show you each of those references, uh, first by telling you the lyric in nine that connects to uh, the other Enneagram songs. The nine lyric, as I write my song, connects to the type one, 
where I sing, I want to sing a song worth singing. And I wanted to uh, make sure that that was the most direct nod because uh, I love the idea that the last song and the first song kind of have this strong connection, uh, this, this strong analogy of, of writing a song, uh, kind of comparing our, our lives to songs. The nine lyric, I retrace my steps, is a nod to the type two song where I say, already tired of trying to recall when it all fell apart. There's kind of a double nod there because uh, the already tired part is, of course, a, a, a nine <laughs> feeling. And then, of course, you know, the, the type two is recalling where it all fell apart. And uh, in this type nine song, I, I'm saying uh, I'm trying to retrace my steps and figure out where I lost track of my heart. Then the type nine lyric through someone else's eyes is a, a tie in to the type three song where I sing through the eyes of no one else. Then the nine lyric let the scale tip uh, is a reference to the type four song where I sing, I lost my balance when I needed it most. Then the nine lyric to restart this heart of mine is a reference to the type five song uh, where I sing hidden in heartbeats. And the nine lyric, which, which I would probably consider the, the key lyric of the song is wake up uh, is a tie in to the type six song where I sing, I woke up so worried that the angels let go. And then the nine lyric, to love ourselves and others well, is a connection to the seven lyric, to love them through and through and through. And then finally, in the nine lyric, wage war on gravity, uh, that is a connection to the type eight song, uh, a few different parts, uh, one in particular, when I sing on the front lines with a purpose. So as I just briefly mentioned, if I had to point to a single lyric in this song that was kind of the point of the whole thing, it would be wake up. So in pretty much every Enneagram book I've read or anybody talking about the Enneagram, uh, usually when anybody talks about the type nine, you'll hear them say things like nines are asleep to themselves. They're asleep to their problems. Uh, and I think that it's mostly helpful language because the nines disengagement is, isn't abrupt and it's not offensive on the surface. It's kind of a, a, a gentle sleepiness. And that brings a host of problems that, um, you know, we nines will be sorting out for <laughs> the majority of our lives. And I've talked a little bit about that in this podcast already, but I also, I kind of wanted to flip the language just a little bit. So in the song, I sing the lyrics, I have been sleepwalking since I was 14. And I like the idea of sleepwalking instead of being asleep. Because I feel like when, when I think back on my life and, and I'm taking an honest look at the, the problems that I discussed earlier, I feel like it was more of a sleepwalking than just being completely checked out. I was showing up. I just wasn't showing up with, with all of me. And I feel like that's kind of what we do when we sleepwalk. So when I wrote the lyric, uh, I've been less than half myself for more than half my life. Uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, that's, that's a direct connection to the story and my realizations about my life. So as I was writing those lyrics, I, I was also thinking about the amount of time that we spend sleeping, uh, and that's about one third of our lives. If we if we each get eight hours a day, uh, that that comes out to be, uh, you know, let's say we live seventy five years, that will be twenty five years of being asleep, uh, nine thousand one hundred twenty five days. And that was interesting to think about, but it was also really sad because uh, when I talk about being less than half myself for more than half my life. Uh, I'm talking about my waking life. I'm not even counting in the, the third of my life that's spent sleeping. So on that cheery note, um, <laughs> one thing I, I realized, and I think it's really funny that I didn't realize this until this point, uh, you know, however many years I've been making music under the name Sleeping At Last, that that is the most appropriate name ever for a type nine's music. <laughs> I never, I never put that together. But uh, as I was reading about all this uh, type nines being asleep to themselves and just reading about all of this language about sleeping, I was like, oh, oh, right. That's, that's uh, what I chose to, to name my music when I was 15 years old. <laughs> so if the Enneagram teaches that nines are asleep to themselves, then the answer is, of course, to wake up. And then if the Enneagram talks about the self-forgetting of the type nine, then the answer is, of course, to remember. Remember who you are. And so, of course, I'm writing that to every type nine, but honestly, I wrote it as a reminder to myself. I just, I hope till my last day that I will continually pursue waking up and continually pursue remembering who I am. So I'm sure that I've mentioned this before in other episodes, but writing lyrics is the most challenging part of songwriting for me. It is incredibly hard for me, and it's it's where I spend most of my time when I'm writing. 
and uh, writing the the lyrics for Type Nine were a, a particularly tall mountain to climb. And as I was struggling to write this song, I was I was trying to keep my butt in the chair and rally as hard as I possibly could, kind of chanting to myself, "You got this, you got this." Uh, for weeks on end, I noticed something that my body has always done when I'm writing, especially when I'm in a, a difficult stretch of writing. And it's the most nine thing ever. My, my body kind of revolts at, without fail. I get so sleepy in those in those rally moments. I, I physically melt into my chair. Uh, and I'm as I'm trying to push through and I'm trying out different lyrics, because uh, when I'm trying different lyrics, I'm, I'm singing them through. And I can barely do it because I keep getting interrupted by a, a bunch of yawns. <laughs> I, I can't I can't stop yawning uh, when I'm when I'm trying to write through this stuff. So uh, it's literally my body raising a white flag in the air saying I give up and my brain kind of being like no we have to we have to finish this song and I just thought that was particularly hilarious as I'm trying to write this this type nine song about waking up and trying to correct that I have been sleepwalking for my, most of my life <laughs> and here I am like having a really hard time just keep my eyes open for uh, for the writing of this song. It feels like the right time to bring Chris back on to share some encouragement for folks that are in relationships with type nine. Uh, and after that, we'll we'll detail the the fingerprint sounds that are in this song, uh, as well as a few other things. So, in relationship with folks who are nine, I, I think there's a a few sort of pieces of advice here for for both parties. And, and first, it's 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 recognizing that type four, type five, and type nine are the most boundaried of the enneagram types. That fours, fives, and nines really do need to have a sense of of of, of space, and that space be honored. And, and this is, is hard to understand because when it looks like the nine is withdrawing, when it looks like the nine is detaching, when it looks like the nine is, is stepping back, it's not because they're not interested or it's not because they don't want to make that connection. It's because when they finally have a sense of autonomy or, or control over what they contribute or give in a relationship, then they are in a deliberate sense going to give their best. And so you have to honor that. You, you got to sort of knock on the door. You can't just sort of show up unannounced. You can't just call in the middle of the afternoon and think they're going to always pick up the phone. You got to let them know like, Hey, I'd love to chat about something or Hey, let's get together. And, 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 and when they show up and when they are present, oh, that activated love almost washes over you. Now, poor nines in relationships do sort of get dragged a little bit. And I, and I think it's really unfair. I think it's a mischaracterization of, of being the merging type of, of losing themselves in, in others. And, and yes, when you look at the subtypes or, or, or the instinctual variants of the nine in their relationships to their self-preservation, their sexual and their social instincts, you see a lot of that pronounced, but in, in three different ways, you, you see the self-preservation nine and, and Naranjo used to call this appetite. You, you see this in, 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 and maybe it's most withdrawn form where, where it really says yes to its sort of creature comfort desires and, and, and what it wants. And that relationship that a nine has to itself, if it can be grounded in love, really is is, is transferred externally in, in incredible abilities to meet the needs of, of their partners or, or members of, of, of their friends or families or communities. Now, there's another nine that shows up, and this is the sort of typical nine that we sort of think is the merging type. And Naranjo used to call this fusion or, or union. And, and, and this is the one who, who sometimes gets mistyped as a two because they're, they're so heart to heart with the person that they care about that they actually lose themselves. And again, this comes from, I think, a, a real sense of wanting to be aligned with enveloped and, and overcome with love and, and that love being shared, that, that love being sort of put out into the world. The, the, the third sort of face that the nines show is this kind of activating around a cause, engaging a, a group that they care for, supporting the, the, the people in their network or community. And Naranjo used to call this participation. And, and these are really energetic nines that, that often don't look like nines. They, they sometimes look like threes. They sometimes look like ones. But this is 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 really sort of a, a snapshot of what it looks like when, when a nine says yes to themselves and then subsequently yes to the others in their life and, and, and yes to, to the people in their world. In relationships, as we look at the harmonic groups, we see that type nine, just like type two and seven, is one of the positive outlook or reframing styles. And so what this means is 
when the stakes get high, when, when the conversation escalates, when, when, when conflict almost looks like it's an inevitability, the, the nine will, in a sense, try to take that and, and, and reframe it by, by, by these really winsome statements that sound like, hey, it's not that bad, or hey, things could be worse, or hey, let's look on, on the bright side. And, and look, they're not downplaying the severity of a situation. They're, they're actually trying to say, we don't have to go there, and why would we? Could we just get another snapshot on this? And, and so what we have to do in our relationship with the nines is, is receive that sort of reframing that positive outlook, that, that recasting, and then accepting it and validating it. What we're, we're doing is we're saying, yes, I hear you. Yes, I, I, I understand you. And, and that establishes a kind of trust. Well, together, the next step could be, but it is actually pretty terrible. Or, hey, we do have to do some hard work here. Or there is something that needs to be dealt with. And, and that's really, in relationship, what's going to be kind of the the stalling force or, or maybe one of the more difficult aspects of, of, of being connected to a nine is the, the sort of lack of inner drive to tackle the hard things, the lack of sort of compulsion to jump in with what may be necessary confrontation, the lack of real desire to sort of learn to fight fair or even have a fight. And, and so in relationship with nines, you really need to sort of be patient and give space, safe space, give time, but really validate the permission to, if we have to, to have a difficult conversation, then we're going to do it. And it, and it. and it will actually lead to our flourishing. Now, the poor nine, right? The communication style for the nines is, is super low key. The, the communication style here is is easy going. It's it, it's relaxed. There's lots of, of of sort of smiles and sweet glances and 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 there's a, a tendency to sort of avoid anything that would disrupt the, the harmony that they've worked so so hard to uh, to curate in their lives. But this communication style comes across as highly suggestive. It's not like the nine wants to put their, 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 the force of their opinions or desires out there. They, they flow ideas. And because it doesn't come across to the rest of us as real clear or like highly opinionated or very forceful, we often overlook it. We often don't even hear it. We almost let it slide by us. And that actually doubles down on them feeling misunderstood, which then, of course, leads to their frustration. So in relationship with a nine, listen to the subtext and, and listen carefully and, and listen to what's not being said, because a lot of nines actually think they're saying it all. They're just using really delicate language to get it out. And in that, often something something can be lost. So for nines out there, you like all of us just simply need to, to learn to, to love yourself, to, to hold yourself with compassion and to be gentle with yourself. And, and I would say if there were three really simple personal affirmations that, that could become a, a mantra that could be tucked in, into sort of a, a meditation practice, one of those would be my opinion matters because your opinion does matter. You're, you're actually, you, you bring a kind of, of a big, picture brilliance that the other eight types don't have. And, and when that brilliance rooted in love and, and sort of internalized in, 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 the, in the psyche that, that makes you one of the most determined of the types comes forward, when you can bring your, your sense of self, your opinions, your desires, what you want into that, you, you just give it more texture. You, you just animate it. So your opinion matters and, and you need to own that and, and, and constantly remind yourself. Secondly, uh, asserting your strength is is welcomed. It's it's not an imposition. We want you to be the strong, fabulous, uh, driven person that you can be. And and so for you to to downplay any of that, for you to sort of tap the brakes on any of that, for you to withhold any of that means something's lost. So assert your strength, own your power, align with it, and, and, and know that it's welcomed. And it's welcomed by the people who care for you the best, who, who know you the best and who love you the best. And, and, and the only sense of imposition that, that may even be part of that equation is the inner critic that's telling you to sort of withhold. Finally, I'll say this. 
You need to determine what's important to you and, 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 and not let go of it. Don't lay that down. Don't acquiesce it. Don't give it up. It's, it's not to be traded away. When you know what's important to you and you have determined what's important to you and, and you live into that, actually, you will get everything you want. You can have everything that you need. But knowing what's important to you doesn't mean that you're not sensitive to what's important to the people in your life. In fact, you learning to determine what's most important to you enhances your ability to determine what's important to the people that you care for and the people that you love. And so it's a kind of of cycling forward. It's saying yes to yourself so that you can continue to say yes to, to those you care for. In in my workshops, one of the, the questions that I had been asked as I was, was doing some of my own advanced trainings and studies was a, a repeating question for the nines. And, and the question was, tell me something you don't want to deal with. And, and then in this repeating question exercise or process, you're, you're actually required to answer that same question for five minutes. I, I think first and foremost for, for nines, when, when you want to, to sort of grow and when you want to sort of plug in um, and, and let all of, of your gifts sort of just bear fruit in the world, you actually have to learn to name the issues, the tasks, the um, aspects that are going unattended in, in your relationships. You, you need to, to, to name all of those things that actually need and require your attention. And, and rather than sort of putting those on a list that you're going to ruminate on later, rather than forgetting about those, you need to take action. So name the issues that have sort of been unattended to in your life. Name the, the tasks that you've yet to follow up or follow through on. Name the, the relationships that you've sort of left hanging or in limbo and engage. Go back into those things, bring closure or continue to work on them. Because if, if you don't, there's actually already for most nines, a, a growing, growing, growing list of things that you don't want to deal with, things that you don't want to attend to. And that actually creates a whole new set of problems. Secondly, for nines, it's, it's, I think the, the, the sort of major advice and, and really, I, I think Ryan, in conversation with you, this has come up quite a bit and I've learned this from you and, and learned what this looks like in, in observing your life and your vocational fidelity and, and your creativity and fecundancy is just showing up is, is bringing your whole self into what it is that you do. If it's your work, if it's, if it's who you love, if, if it's your leisure or how you play, it's just showing up. It's being present and being present in your body and being there. And, and it's such a gift. I, I mean, I, these last couple of years, some of the, the most important people in my lives suddenly are nines. And I will say this, nines can be grounding. Nines can, can, can be incredible mentors. Nines are remarkable in their support for, for others. But this only happens when they show up and, and when they say yes to themselves. Third, I'm going to say this. Um, you have to learn to experience your own anger you have to actually find some levity and in, in letting yourself express your anger. And, and then as you begin to relate to your anger, you will see that it is your anger that will guide your discernment. It will actually help develop your capacity to make incredible decisions. It will, will bring a sharpness to your clarity. And, and, and this ability that you have to arbitrate and mediate to, to sort of referee and, and to sort of split the hair Will, will actually be enhanced, but that will be enhanced by getting in touch with the things that, that, that make you sad, that, that, that sort of grind on your frustration and, and that allow you to sort of let out this, this hidden anger. So your anger, I, I know this is really difficult for Heinz to even sort of comprehend your, your anger is actually one of your, your greatest gifts. Learning to relate to it in a healthy way will actually help you develop and grow in discernment. Fourth, I'm going to, I'm going to just say this, like nines, you, you got to get back into your bodies and, and it's not that you're disembodied, but I think for a lot of nines, it's almost as if your head is a balloon floating on the water. There's a, a lightness, there's a, a, a laid backness, but there's a kind of distanced sort of visceral experience of being embodied in your body. 
And so that, that may mean hugging people in your life a little bit more. That may be doing something that energizes or activates your body. Like I said, maybe yoga or, or getting into the fitness center, maybe acupuncture. I mean, and there's a lot of ways to do this, but getting into your body is also going to help you grow into a kind of three centered awareness. And this three centered awareness will actually allow your instincts and your intuition to support your feelings and emotions, which, which then can be validated and justified with your head center. And Gurjeev, the man who, who really brought the Enneagram forward, um, a little over a hundred years ago said this, he said that until you have a, a three centered awareness experience, you've never had a spiritual experience. And so for the nine to have a spiritual experience it has to be visceral. It has to be embodied, it has to be in your body. And finally, I'll say this, if you're nine and, and you have a mindfulness, a, a meditation or a contemplative practice, a, a way that you nurture or nourish your spirituality, whatever that may be then I, I really do suggest that nines learn to embrace stillness. Now, nines love that at the outset because nines are like, man, I'm super chilled out. I'm super dialed back. I'm the stillest person you know. But this isn't a kind of stillness that supports that sort of inner slumber. This is not a stillness that allows you to fall asleep. This isn't embracing it. This is being alert. This is being attentive. This is showing up in the stillness of not having to arbitrate and mediate everything outside yourself, but actually embracing yourself, looking inward, and, and in very sort of quiet ways, beginning to knit together the fragmented bits of your own psyche, your own ego ego and your own heart. And when you can engage that stillness, what you are developing is, is the kind of capacity to know what restraint looks like for the nine. Because nines can get overcommitted. They can get drawn into everybody's drama, everybody's lives. Nines get volunteered to help out with everything. And that becomes a, a real stressor. And that stressor can become a trigger. When when you actually embrace and engage your stillness, you, you learn to grow in restraint and restraint actually gives you ability to learn what to say yes to. And, and this yes will be your yes and you will have power over this yes and, and you'll want to follow these yeses rather than feeling obligated by being volunteered for, for somebody else's cause or, or program or project. So embrace stillness and, and in embracing stillness, you'll actually see that you begin to wake up. So one of the best parts about making this podcast is in moments like right now, I, I get to edit out all of my tears <laughs> and I get to re-record myself and, and sound totally composed. Chris, thank you so much. What a, what a gift. Thank you for, for pouring so much light over each of the types and in this podcast. It, it has been an absolute joy. And though this is the final episode about each of the types, Chris and I actually decided to do another episode in the very near future, kind of an overview of all nine songs, all nine types, uh, and just have a conversation about all of it. So that'll be coming in the very near future. But we're actually not done with this episode, even though it sounds like I'm wrapping things up. Okay, I've got a few more things to share with you about this song. Uh, I also want to tell you about all the fingerprint sounds that my, my nearest and dearest Type 9 sent me, uh, which I think will officially make this the longest of the Enneagram song episodes. So if you're still with me, thank you so much. <laughs> So though writing the majority of the song was really, really hard, uh, as I've taken now about two hours to, <laughs> to explain to you, uh, the one lyric that did come actually during the initially fun and kind of effortless part of writing the song was actually the opening line, who am I to say what any of this means? It's such a simple line, but it has a lot of different meanings inside it. Uh, and honestly, it was the, the kind of the guiding light of my writing for this, because at multiple points, I, I was ready to toss the song in the garbage. And this opening line just, it, it had so much meaning to me. First, it, I'm setting up a question for myself. Who am I? And you'll notice a slight pause after those words, uh, even though the full line is, who am I to say what any of this means? I, I wanted to frame that that first initial question kind of on its own uh, as a symbol of this song being about my own type. And, and this opening line is actually a commentary on this entire Enneagram project, because really, who am I to say what any of this means, to, to write from the perspective of all nine types? And especially because I just told you that I've barely scratched the surface of figuring out who I am. And those lyrics also reflect, I, I think, a bit of the nine's hesitancy, like their, their self-dismissal, or, or like it's kind of like the, the nine is conceding like right out of the gate. 
this line is also asking what what do all of these songs mean altogether? Like, what's the point of writing these nine songs? Uh, so I spend the rest of the song trying to kind of figure out all of those different things. Myself, who am I? What, what's my purpose? What's my redemption story? And then finally, at the end of the song, what what do all these nine songs mean? And, and the answer to all of those questions is this, uh, and this is kind of a full circle thing, it's empathy. The point of this project at its absolute best is empathy. I think the point of the Enneagram at its absolute best is a tool for empathy. Uh, and it's empathy towards each other and it's empathy towards ourselves. So writing these eight other Enneagram songs, I, I was exploring empathy towards others. Uh, and of course, in writing this Type 9 song, my song, uh, I'm attempting to uh, empathize with myself. And so as I was finishing the, the final lines of the song, I, I realized a few things about empathy. Uh, so the definition of empathy, uh, according to the, the Webster Dictionary, is the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another. Uh, reading that, I was, I was surprised and, and actually kind of moved because the word action is such a, an important, it's like the, the leading word in that definition. And I think that that's what this song is about. That's what I'm slowly striving toward, not just understanding, but the action of understanding others and myself. And, and that action requires all of me, maybe my heart especially. So at some point along the way, I, I absolutely knew that this song needed to end on the word do. Uh, that is what us nines need to be aiming at. As Chris mentioned, we should be showing up and doing. But ending on that word isn't only because of the redemption of the nine, it's also a connection point, a segue into the music that I'll actually be writing in the future, the next chapter of Atlas. I've mentioned before, Atlas 1 were songs all about the origins of all things, uh, and Atlas 2, uh, those songs were about involuntary human development, what we're born with. Uh, and in the future, there will be an Atlas 3, and it will be all about voluntary human development. It's what we do with all of that we're given. So to end this song, the, the final song of my Atlas 2 series, I knew that it needed to hint at what's next. Oh, and if you've heard this song on headphones, you may or may not have noticed that the song actually ends on a breath. Uh, when I was recording it at the end of one of my takes, I, I noticed that I instinctively inhaled like real deeply after one of the takes. Uh, not an exhale, but but an inhale. Uh, so it wasn't a sigh of relief or anything like that. It was it was getting ready. Uh, and to me, that inhale represents getting ready for the work, the, the personal work that needs to be done in me. And that's that's where this song ends. It's it's a nudge for all of us type nines to to wake up. But it's also a nudge for everyone to do the the hard work that we're all kind of in nine different ways uh, avoiding or guarding ourselves against or are just unaware of. Oh, and, and I knew that this song needed to end on a resolving chord, uh, almost like making peace with the song and with the project and uh, with Atlas too. So let's go ahead and talk about the fingerprints in this song. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you haven't listened to any of the previous episodes, uh, fingerprints are what I'm calling these these sounds that my, my friends and family have sent to me. Um, well before I started this project, I, I asked my, my friends and family if they happened to know their Enneagram type. And if so, would they be up for sending me uh, just like a tiny sound of literally anything? Uh, and I will weave that sound into the fabric of one of these songs that represent their types. So that's what fingerprints are. Are, and uh, let's detail all of the nine fingerprints. So the first fingerprint is from my friend Aaron Strumpel, who is an incredible musician, uh, and he was kind enough to send me the sound of him playing trumpet. The next sound is from my friend Paul Bessenbacher, who I've known for a long time, and I was so happy that he was able to send me a sound. He is an incredible composer, and uh, he sent the sound of the, the sustain pedal on his piano. The next sound is from my dear friend, Bob Davidson, who uh, not only was kind enough to recommend the, the choir that you heard throughout the song, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but also he sent the sound of his Tesla. So it's his car driving. And we, we have a mutual love for, for all things Tesla. Next is from my friend who goes by Science Mike. Uh, this is Mike McCarg. He was kind enough to send me actually 11 sounds. Uh, he sent the sound of water and walking and sitting in his favorite spot in nature. And so I put all these sounds together and um, kind of put them in, in the order of like far and then close and then walking past different textures. So it kind of tells a little, a little sonic story.
Uh, I totally love how that sounds, but I will say it does make me have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so if subliminally in the song, if you're listening to type nine and you all of a sudden have to go to the bathroom, this might be why. The next sound is from my friend TJ Hill, who I mentioned uh, a while ago in this episode. He sent the sound of disintegration where all of the different Enneagram songs are playing at the same time and it sounds super chaotic. Um, and I loved, I loved his description. He said the disintegration is kind of seeing all sides of everything can drive a person to despair, which is, which is true. And of course, because he's awesome, he also sent the sound of integration. So he took all of those songs and, and kind of created a more harmonious, like a sonic bed of each of them. And so I did use both. I used disintegration and integration because these songs do hold both. The next sound is actually from a family member. This is my incredibly sweet sister-in-law, Andrea Pope, and it's the sound of her running. Drea also sent me the sound of water. And the next sound is from my awesome friend, Wilhelmina Shoger, who oddly enough actually sent the same sound as my sister-in-law, Drea. Uh, this is the sound of Wilhelmina running. And what I loved about that is that two of my, my type nine friends sent something that's active. It's, it's action. It's, it's doing. And I thought that was really great for this song. So uh, both of those sounds are actually under when I sing about gravity. And they're also on the very, very final line when I, when I end the song on that word do. Next is from a dear family friend, Lynn Holstein, who chose the sound of children laughing, which I think is such a perfect sound. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Uh, the next sound is from my, my sweet friend, Maria Goff, who uh, sent the sound of her baking banana bread. And I love the note that she sent with it. She said, this recording is the sound of flour, sugar, eggs, butter, and banana being mixed by hand in a metal bowl with my favorite spoon. I've probably made this bread a thousand times, but today let's pretend it's my ninth. And this sound is from my friend Ashley Goff, who actually happens to be the daughter-in-law of Maria, whose sound you just heard. And this is the sound of her drawing a bath. And in her words, she said that uh, after a long week, and it's one of her favorite ways to recalibrate and gain a bit more peace. And my friend Tara Brown sent me three sounds, and they're, they're really great and so thoughtful. Um, and she sent along these, these uh, really sweet notes as well. So the first is a sewing a patchwork quilt. And she says that quilts represent warmth, comfort, peace, and uh, are, are a rare part of her heritage. She also sent this note along with that sound. It struck me how nines see both sides to everything, and they want everyone to get along and see each other's viewpoints, and, and that sewing a patchwork quilt is an incredible artistic representation of that. Next, she sent the sound of opening the front door, uh, and she says, this is the representing of me showing up in life, holding firmly in the belief that it matters that I show up and share my voice and presence. And lastly, she sent the sound of her dog Roxy drinking water. I love all those sounds. So sweet, Tara. Thank you for putting so much thought. And, and clearly, Tara knows her Enneagram. Um, so these are, these are really beautiful thoughts and sounds. Next is a sound from my friend David Dark, who is an incredible author. And David sent this quote. Who are you? Where are you from? Uh, the next sound is from my longtime friend, Ryan Taylor. He sent the sound of his dog. The next sound is from Jill of Jill and Kate, uh, incredible musicians, and uh, she sent the sound near her uh, favorite cliffs in New England. Uh, it's the waves crashing along the shoreline. Uh, the next sound is from a dear family friend and uh, an incredible painter, Mandy Neumeister. Uh, this is the sound of her paintbrush. Next sound is from one of my best friends, Ryan Paul, who is an incredible musician. Uh, he makes music under the name Wax Wayne. You should definitely check them out. Uh, and he sent the sound of the Mall of America, uh, but more specifically, it's a recording of people. And my friend Nate Gehring sent the sound of his sweet little one saying, Daddy. And I use this on uh, the lyric, there's a chain reaction in your heart, because that's what kids do to us. Daddy. And the next sound is from Beth McCord, who is an incredible Enneagram teacher. Um, she sent the sound of a nighttime campfire and, and said that a, a good campfire is shared with loved ones on a restful day or night. The main thing is comfort and smells. 
And then the next one is from my friend Tyler Wolford, who's a filmmaker uh, and does a lot of work for an incredible organization called Love Does. And he sent the very appropriate sound of camera clicks. So the very last fingerprint in this song is actually my own. I included a sound of my my two girls, Lily and Iris, laughing, uh, but I also included this sound. That's the sound of my sweet dog, Wilco, uh, and his little snore while he sleeps. And I am so heartbroken that, that Wilco passed away a few days before recording this podcast. He, he was 14 years old, and, and I know it sounds absolutely cliche, but he was my best little friend. He, he was such a sweet dog, and we are so grateful that we got to be his family. Uh, and he has been such a, a special part of our life for these last 14 years. He sat next to me uh, as my little co-producer on, on literally every song I've recorded over the last 14 years. Uh, and this sound of him snoring is what I heard on a day-to-day -day basis while I'm making music. And, and as I was writing this last song, he was there with me, which feels really special because this is not only the final Enneagram song, uh, it's the final Atlas II song. And it's a song that happens to be about me remembering how to use my heart and how to allow my heart to be opened up and, and more forward. So I'm convincing myself that, that Wilco knew that by saying goodbye now, it would, it would help me remember to keep my heart opened up. My family and I will miss that little guy so much, and uh, we are just really grateful that we got the time that we got with him. Again, here's another moment where I am so thankful that I get to edit out my, my tears. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to do that in my actual life, but um, on a podcast, it feels like the appropriate thing to do is to pull myself together. So I, I dedicate this song to my, my little co-producer, Wilco. Well, I, I think that's everything. <laughs> and I think we did it. I think we recorded the longest podcast ever recorded in the history of time, at least the, the longest episode of my podcast. What an honor, truly, it is to get to talk through all this with you. Uh, sincerely, writing this song was a form of therapy, but but getting to process it over the course of this podcast and, and hearing from Chris, it's, it's been a real gift. And I hope that if you happen to identify as a type nine as well, I, I hope that something here in the song, in this episode, makes some amount of sense to you. And, and I hope that you feel loved and heard and honored by the song. And for anyone that's listening to this podcast, I, I am so grateful that you guys uh, are curious about how these songs get made. So thank you. I, I am deeply blessed by uh, this, this absolute privilege of getting to talk to you guys. And a huge thanks to Chris Hewerts for being our Enneagram expert. Um, as I mentioned, Chris and I are going to do another episode uh, in the very near future, and uh, it will be kind of an overview episode about uh, all nine songs, all nine types, the process of learning about the Enneagram and translating those types into songs, the artwork for each of the songs. And uh, I can't wait to talk with you guys again. And I'm so excited about the future of this podcast. I'll be telling you guys more birth stories of how each of my songs came together. Uh, I'll be sharing new music with you guys. Uh, I'll be talking about the future of Atlas. And um, there's just a lot more ahead of that I'm really, really excited to, to get to share with you. Uh, but Chris's book, The Sacred Enneagram, if you don't already have it, go buy it. It's seriously so beautiful. And uh, it's available everywhere books are. And of course, this song is available everywhere music is. So now that you've heard its birth story, uh, I'm so excited to have the song play one more time, um, which will end the episode. Once again, thank you for letting me process. Thank you for letting me uh, get to share with you guys this song that means so much to me. Who am I to say what any of this means? I have been sleepwalking since I was 14. Now, as I write my song, I retrace my steps. Honestly, it's easier. To let myself forget Still I check my vital signs Choked up I realize I've been less than half
half myself for more than half my life. Wake up, fall in love again. Wait, So much worth fighting for, you'll see. Another domino falls. Either way. It looks like empathy to understand all sides, but I'm just trying to find myself through someone else's eyes. So show me what to do to restart this heart. How do I forgive myself for losing so much time? Wake up, roll up your sleeves. There's a chain reaction. So memory, remembering who you are, stand up and fall in love again and again and again. Waves roll on gravity. There's so much worth fighting. Another domino falls, and another domino falls. A little at a time, I feel more alive. I let the scale tip. Feel all of it. It's uncomfortable, but right. And we were born to try to see each other through, to know and love ourselves and others well. It's the most difficult. And meaningful words.